Well, hi everybody, uh, this is uh, Louise Ross um, and I'm here today to introduce Billy Berneski, who is a health behaviour scientist and professor at the Faculty of Health and Medicine at the University of Newcastle. Uh, Billy's uh, research focuses on developing and evaluating methods to help people change their behaviours. And she has a strong interest in working in tobacco uh, control with priority populations. Her presentation today is about the e-cigarette and vaping use lung injury cases in the USA. And she's going to talk about what we know so far about those and also what we don't know. Thanks for this opportunity to talk about this topic. I've learnt a lot <laughs> since you invited me um, to give this webinar. Um, I had to do some very quick reading on this topic and it's really interesting and I hope that um, uh, people going in today find it as interesting as I did. Okay, so here we go. Just a quick disclosure slide. Uh, we see funding from a number of sources, but of course not from the you know, vaping industry in any form whatsoever. Um, so today, and I hope that everybody can hear me okay. Um, today's uh, presentation, I'll provide a very quick, uh, brief background to vaping, particularly the team vaping and products, um, an overview of um, the good trials data that we have at the moment on the effectiveness and um, safety of nicotine vaping. Um, and then I'll move into the US lung cases, the lung injury cases, and look at some of the characteristics of those lung cases, the timeline of how it's um, all evolved this year, and then spend a little bit of time around the, the communications and the media of portrayal um, of these lung injury cases in the USA that have been terribly tragic. Um, okay, so just very quickly, uh, a little bit of a background on vaping. What is vaping? Well, put very simply, it's the act of inhaling and exhaling vapour that's produced by e-cigarettes or a similar device. Um, e-cigarettes don't produce smoke. And what they produce is an aerosol um, that that's made up from the Um, there's all, all different types of vaping devices, not just e-cigarettes, but there's now in pipes, as you can see um, down here, e-cigars, there's uh, different types of e-cigarettes, um, there's pod type devices here. Um, and generally, um, these devices consist of a number of components, the mouthpiece, the the person um, inhales through um, a battery, a cartridge that contains the ear liquid, and then a heating component like a coil um, that's uh, heated through a battery. And uh, that coil heats the ear liquid that produces the aerosol that is inhaled by the, the person who is vaping. Um, the nicotine e liquid or, or, or e liquid to vaporize the products usually contains a propylene glycol or vegetable glycerin based liquid and it can come with or without nicotine. Um, people might mix nicotine in themselves and similarly they might mix flavoring in themselves as well. It, it doesn't um, necessarily contain tobacco. There's quite a lot of devices as well, and perhaps the, the more um, famous or infamous um, is the dual pod and there's a diagram down here on the slide. It looks like, when it's all put together, it looks like a USB device. They're, they're very small and um, those pod -like devices don't require people to do the mixing of the liquids themselves. Um, there's, it, it's a forever evolving field, both the devices and the liquids. So, you know, one of the more recent developments, for example, is nicotine salt based um, uh, uh, e liquid 
And, and of course, there's cannabis products as well available for making my CBD oil or THC oil. Um, so you probably know that <coughs> vaping is becoming very popular. Um, and nicotine vaping and vaping devices get to the US market. Around 2007 or 2006, depending on what you read. And there's many different types um, and brands of devices and liquid products. And there are um, regulatory differences between countries um, that allow or don't allow vaping. Uh, generally speaking, though, it's illegal in countries like the US, the UK, many European countries, some parts of Asia, and most recently Canada and New Zealand. And then there's countries that ban vaping outright, um, like India most recently, um, Malaysia, Brazil, or other countries um, where vaping is banned. In Australia, um, the, the regulations around vaping are a little bit complex. Um, they vary state by state, but generally speaking, um, retailing nicotine containing vaping devices is prohibited. Um, and um, there are bait shops in Australia, but they sell uh, simply the devices and non nicotine liquids available through those devices in Australia. Uh, nicotine is usually classified as a poison, unless ironically it's in tobacco cigarettes, um, and of course, nicotine replacement therapy. Um, so this table is just a bit of a summary of um, prevalence of vaping around the world and um, please take into account that um, these numbers are not directly comparable because in each country different questions and different samples were used but um, it's just to paint a picture of how popular vaping is becoming and how widespread it's becoming. There are estimates that there's about 41 million uh, people vaping around the world. Um, oh, and I should just mention, I do have references um, at the end of my presentation as well, and, and they'll be available for all of my slides. Um, in the US, where these lung injury cases occur, there's just under 7 million people vaping. Um, in the UK, it's about uh, 3 million, according to this one particular survey. Um, and then there's these you know, smaller countries like Australia, Canada, New Zealand, where there's um, smaller numbers of people vaping in as well. Um, so this is just to, to set the scene a little bit on the context for these lung injury um, cases in the US. Um, most of the people who vape, um, when surveyed in large population-based surveys, report to be ex-smokers, and there's you know sort of um, observational studies that suggest that people use vaping as a way to quit tobacco smoking. Um, of course, the randomised control trials um, are perhaps. Um, the, the gold standard method for identifying the effectiveness of um, nicotine vaping for smoking cessation or for helping people quit smoking. And while it's still um, a, a fairly new field, there is more research emerging, and we've now got a few uh, randomized controlled trials that suggest that um, compared to placebo or to um, nicotine replacement therapy, um, that nicotine vaping uh, with or without nicotine patches um, are effective at helping people quit smoking. They're um, you know, perhaps not 
um, you know, it's not 100% success, but then we don't have anything that is 100% success. But um, um, certainly it suggests that um, people who vape might find it easier to quit than via uh, other forms of nicotine replacement therapy. And these trials also um, monitored um, adverse events very carefully. And um, that gives an indication at least for the duration of the trial, which is usually six or six months long. An indication of uh, safety, some measures around safety, particularly in comparison to um, the nicotine replacement, other forms of nicotine replacement therapy, and most of these um, studies found no differences in numbers of adverse events um, between e-cigarette use and nicotine replacement therapy with the exception of Peter Hyatt's trial in the UK that found higher rates of throat and mouth irritation um, in the e-cigarette group compared to the NRT group, but then they also found higher rates of nausea in the NRT group compared to the e-cigarette group. So there's probably equivalence in terms of the, um, any adverse events that people might be reporting um, it's important to point out that um, these adverse events weren't necessarily linked or caused by the, um, the products under investigation as well. So, so that was a very, very brief background or, or outline um, um, about vaping, um, what the evidence suggests um, so far it seems to be that Nicotine vaping shouldn't be considered a healthy alternative or a harmless activity. However, um, it, it does appear to be less harmful than continued tobacco smoking, and it may assist people to give up tobacco cigarette smoking. Um, it shouldn't be recommended to people who aren't smoking or, or to young people. Um, and we certainly report more research and build that evidence base around effectiveness for cessation and safety and, and also um, look at more research around youth uptake as well. Um, so that's that's sort of the context that these uh, lung injury cases occur in. So I'll move into um, talking about so now, sorry, I'm just having to fix my slides as well. Um, okay, so the first symptoms and hospital admissions um, were noted in, in March of this year. And the first CDC statement appeared in August 17, referring simply to a cluster of pulmonary illnesses linked to e cigarette use. Um, and at that stage, there were about 94 um, probable cases of this lung illness. So I was referring to it as the lung illness at the time. Um, and it looked like it was associated with baby. Um, and then around mid-September, the term illness was changed to injury. And um, the cases were, or the outbreak was given a, a name, uh, which is e cigarette or vaping product use associated lung injury, or Ivali. I'm not sure how to pronounce it properly. I, I call it Ivali. Um, and it remains a diagnosis of exclusion because even now we, there's no specific test or marker. Um, for diagnosing Evali. Um, the way that cases are defined by the Centre for Disease Control, the CDC, uh, um, through this um, definition of people reporting to her vape or dad, and dad is usually cannabis in, in 90 days prior to, to the reporting of. Um, there's a radiograph or CT scan that identifies some sort of substance in the lungs, um, absence of infection, 
um, any other respiratory infectious disease testing is negative and there's no evidence for other plausible diagnoses. Uh, probable cases similarly are uh, defined um, as having baked in the last 90 days and to start showing um, and also the team believing that it's not an infection and there's no um, alternative diagnosis. So there's now been um, uh, some reporting of um, the demographic uh, characteristics of, and, and what people are making. Um, some information on what people are, are making that are uh, developing these cases of Kivani. Um, this comes from the CDC website. They appear to be mostly male um, and unfortunately very young. So uh, the majority of our cases are young. Um, majority appear to be Vaping THC um, and some are reporting nicotine use as well. And there's a small proportion that claim to be only using or only vaping nicotine. And I'll come back to this point in, in a little in a little while. Uh, this is what um, this is what people are experiencing. Um, so there's quite significant respiratory symptoms, shortness of breath, cough, chest pain. There's gastrointestinal symptoms, like vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain. There's fever, chills, fatigue, headache, tachycardia, tachymenia. Uh, low blood oxygen. It, it's very, very distressing for people who are experiencing these, these symptoms. Um, so there's been a number of uh, pathology studies as well. Very early on, uh, one study uh, of just five cases uh, suggested there might be lipoid pneumonia. Um, and th this was very early on where they were still thinking it, it might be infection related to inhalation of a fatty substance. Um, but since that study, which was early September, uh, there's, there's been um, really no further uh, suggestion that it's lipoid pneumonia. And now, um, and then it was you know, sort of more pretty. Um, something related to inhaling of toxic substances, inflammation of lung tissue. And this is what um, the timeline, of the presentation of symptoms and admissions to hospital looks like. Now this, this graphic comes from the CDC website and it's updated regularly. So this one I, um, I copied from yesterday's uh, website, and I believe that they updated they update them um, every Thursday. So there may be an update this week. But as you can see, sort of suggests that we may have passed the peak um, of these lung injury cases. Certainly hoping so, but of course. Um, the, the decline um, also is due in part to a reporting lag. So um, there may be a longer tail here as well. We'll, we'll see what that looks like. Okay. Okay. Um, so where it stands now is that there's over 2,000 cases. And they've been reported across the whole of the USA except for one state, Alaska. And that includes 47 deaths, which is really, really tragic and um, uh, a terrible situation. Uh, 
Okay, so it's important, of course, to try to work out what's causing Ivalia and the primary way that we can address it is to know what's causing it. And there's been a number of studies um, that have been coming out that have been looking at this. And um, most of the studies are looking at uh, associations uh, with, with cases. So uh, this study, you know, um, sort of fairly early on started to notice that a large proportion of patients were using THC vaping products, um, as well as reporting nicotine vaping products. Um, and that those reporting the THC use, a large proportion were, um, were, were saying that they got their THC solution from off the street, black market sources, often referred to as informal sources, online, illicit dealers, and so on. Um, and a large proportion of patients reported getting those um, products from one particular company referred to as Dank Faith, uh, which is a counterfeit brand um, traded illicitly online. Um, other studies, um, as time's gone by, um, have started looking at biopsies of lung fluid as well, and have started implicating another substance, which is vitamin E acetate, um, which in this particular study was found in 100% of the samples uh, tested, and, um, and THC was in a high proportion of the samples, um, and some other possible um, substances uh, that there was no link found there at all. So what is vitamin E acetate? It's, um, it's a solution that's used in marijuana black market to stretch the THC oil um, and, and used to fill the vape cartridges. Um, and labs have shown high vitamin E concentrations in some THC e-liquid products, particularly the illicit ones, popular because they're similar to THC oil, but cheaper. Um, this more recent study compared um, people with a valley, um, people vapors or people who vape but um, don't have the valley. So, like a case control study matching for a number of characteristics. And they started to draw up a, um, a picture of risk factors for the valley, if you can um, call them risk factors. The, these factors tend to be associated. Uh, with cases, so if you're vaping THC, if you're a frequent vapor, if you're purchasing from black market or informal sources, and if you're using dank vape products, um, there was higher association with um, e-valley cases. Um, so this table just summarises some of these studies that have been coming out. And the probable risk factors that seem to be coming out as associated with Avali, um, vitamin E acetate within the solutions, THC, um, obtaining the THC from informal sources, um, younger age, male gender, and these dank vape brands. Uh, seem to be associated with cases as well. So a, a picture is starting to come out of what might be likely causes of the, um, the lung injury. So 
So just a little bit of information on these dang baits uh, for my own benefit because I have no idea what they <laughs> were. But um, dang baits is a fake company or a fake brand. Uh, it's not a single brand, but it seems to be a company that exists in boxes that can be bought from wholesalers in China and then filled with whatever the buyer pleases and then resold to the black market. Um, often sold through social media. And sometimes these products contain pesticides, but they're often cut with vitamin agents like the vitamin and the acetate that I've already mentioned. Um, it's important to note that people can obtain these online in Australia as well. So it, it's important to uh, be aware and, and have the right information to, to give to users. Um, Important also to note that street bought THC vaping was linked to Ovali as early as August by some of the um, state or county health authorities that were investigating Ovali cases in their own county. And in the US, some arrests have been made. So this is just one example of a report of a man in Wisconsin who um, was arrested for, for running a uh, yeah, uh, black market dank bait uh, scheme. Uh, so it's, it's something that authorities in the US are taking very, very seriously um, to clamp down on the, the illicit markets. Uh, a little bit more information on vitamin E acetate. Um, these are, you know, some some of the, the brands that um, and, and the bottles that they come in to cut honey cut. Um, so as I mentioned, it used the added to vaping products uh, that contain THC as a way to cut or dilute the THC. It's cheap and it's odorless. Um, an early September, New York health officials started to link cases of the, the lung illness to the vitamin E acetate in cannabis containing vaping products. Um, and the, here's my telephone, sorry. Uh, the CDC finally announced. Uh, vitamin E acetate as a breakthrough um, development in early November. And um, again, um, just a, an example here of the authorities um, taking this very serious and very seriously um, chasing uh, people who don't know if the term deal in, in these substances and um, produce them and um, on sell vitamin D acetate. Okay, so this is the latest now that we have about uh, vitamin D. The acetate, which is only last week um, uh, published by the CDC. And it becomes clearer that um, vitamin E acetate um, is implicated in these lung disease cases. Uh, they analysed 20 vaping products seized from the black market. Um, during the outbreak this year and compared them to product C uh, 2018 before this outbreak happened, vitamin E acetate was in all samples um, in the 2019 um, samples, but not in the 2018 samples. Found in THC containing products, um, not in any products containing nicotine. Um, and of course, they do point out that all these studies, they're, they're studies of association, not causation. So they, you know, they can't prove that vitamin E actually causes lung injury, but um, the associations appear quite strong. But 
investigations are ongoing. There may be um, more than one chemical involved. Um, the CDC and the FDA are still looking into this, but um, at the moment it looks like three port THC vaping solutions containing vitamin and acetate are uh, um, possibly the most risky uh, for people to use. So I just um, wanted to provide a note about um, the problem with relying on um, patient self-report of uh, what they might be vaping, which certainly in the early days uh, was what authorities uh, were vaping their advice on. And some people were reporting uh, not to have vaped THC oil, they were claiming to only be vaping nicotine. In the US, nicotine uh, vaping is legal, whereas cannabis use um uh, had uh, varied uh, regulations uh, federally it's um it, it's illegal but there's differences across states where some states um have uh legal marijuana or cannabis use and, and other states don't allow it and the penalties are different in different states um, so it's understandable that initially some people were claiming to only abate um, nicotine. And then once the uh, investigations were ongoing and, and they found that um, some people admitted to misreporting um, and this is a sample of young men, you know, often 19 year olds who might be um, reluctant to admit to be uh, vaping, you know, something that uh, may or may not be legal in their state, but it's certainly cannabis vaping is still not exactly mainstream, it's, it's still not something you want to be telling your parents about um, if you're a young person. Um, and some cases reporting nicotine only vaping have returned urine samples, which is all THC positive. So it's clearer now that nicotine is unlikely associated with causing the lung injury. Um, this is one study um, just, just repeating um, or highlighting that point about people who reported not using THC then uh, tested positive for urinary THC screens um, or uh, chart reviews, re-interviews, cross-referencing with friends, um, uh, revealing that they were actually uh, THC oil vapors. Um, and this presents a challenge, obviously, for, for physicians and for doctors. Uh, so the way that the USA um, has responded, the, certainly the, um, the FDA has made it quite clear um, to people that, that there won't be any uh, prosecution. Um, for individual cases, they want people to be honest with reporting um, exactly what they were what they were vaping. And also the CDC um, has encouraged doctors to ask not only whether people vape, but what it is exactly that they're vaping, and to do so in an empathetic and non-judgmental and private way so that people don't feel uh, threatened um, in order to tell the truth um, if they are using illicitly obtained products. All right, so um, just moving on now to a little bit about the media reporting. Um, 
And I thought that this was important to cover because um, it also can causes some confusion in people and it, it causes confusion um, to doctors and to those of us who, who work with people who, who rate and, and what the right advice might be to give to people. Um, so THC was implicated in, in US media as early as August of this year. Um, and the fact that the THC oil was obtained from black market sources was um, also presented fairly early, um, only a few weeks after the first cases of um, THC um, involvement were reported. And then vitamin E acetate involvement was reported a little bit later, you know, late September, around early October. Um, so this is one example of um, media reporting in the US uh, dated August 22nd, um, and it clearly says that you know, the CDC um, has started um, to indicate uh, THC vaping um, in these cases of Ali. And then as time went on, um, so this media report here is from October 31, um, and it makes the point that the CDC is still warning people to stop vaping completely um, because of these lung illness cases, but why? And um, so this report was making the point that um, Although the CDC was starting to acknowledge that products that contain THC sold on the black market were what they, you know, what were they, what they believed were um, most strongly associated with the lung injury cases, but um, some of the language that the CDC was using in um, in saying things like the cause, um, the specific compound or ingredient causing the lung injury is not yet known. Um, their recommendations were that persons should consider refraining from all e-cigarette or vaping products. And um, the psychiatrist who was making the point that that was, that was leading to confusion in, in the public. Um, and went on to say that uh, providing clearer data can help guide some difficult conversations around risks and benefits, um, particularly in populations that might be using THC containing baits for medical purposes. And, and it was really important to make that distinction between THC oil or even CBD oil um, baking for medicinal purposes versus you know, uh, uh, solutions that were bought on the black market. Um, but also the need to, um, um, to distinguish nicotine um, baking from uh, deep lung cases as well, because um, if nicotine vaping was associated, then that should be made absolutely clear by the CDC. Um, but also, if not, that that also should, should be made absolutely clear by the CDC, because some people are using nicotine vaping um, as an alternative for from tobacco cigarette smoking. Um, so this is the actual um, CDC advice um, and they very clearly now recommend that people do not use THC containing cigarettes or vaping products and that people should not buy these products from um, informal sources and that they should not uh, add or, uh, or modify uh, their solutions um, in any way as well. Um, they make it clear that it appears that vitamin E 
acetate is, is what's associated with their barley. Um, but they don't yet rule out other contributors. And they do um, say that other substances and uh, product sources are still under investigation and that there may be more than one cause. And the only way to ensure that you're not at risk while the investigation continues is to refrain from using any e-cigarette or vaping product. So that there could still be confusing for some people. Um, they very clearly um, recommend against going back to tobacco smoking. So if, um, if vaping is a person's only alternative to tobacco smoking, they should not go back to tobacco smoking. They should weigh risks and benefits. Considering all of this information um, that shows that it's, it's, it's most likely THC oil products sourced from black market uh, vendors and containing vitamin E that contains the highest risk. The advice and um, uh, this is uh, fairly standard advice, but they do also advise that persons with a marijuana use disorder should seek evidence-based treatment by a healthcare provider. Um, and um, that ongoing problematic use of THC containing e-cigarette or vaping products should seek um, treatment uh, from the recovery service. So what's the advice in Australia? Um, this statement was released from our Chief Medical Officer in September. And unfortunately, it's not been updated with all the recent developments. Um, it is very much framed around nicotine vaping. Uh, it has not incorporated um, the latest um, US information. So it still defines uh, the person most at risk of people who use any sort of e-cigarettes and uh, recommends that people using, and this comes directly from their website, um, individuals that use e-cigarettes um, and experience any respiratory symptoms should seek medical advice. So it's a very broad, um, very broad sweeping um, statement on any sort of vaping and e-cigarettes at this stage with, you know, sort of um, warnings against liquid nicotine here as well. Um, so how is the media in Australia been reporting um, about the US uh, lung cases. Um, well, the earlier reports echoed the, the CDC broad portion, which you would um, And uh, so as an example, the, the Melbourne age, this was in early September, said things like, this will strengthen the hand of the health minister, Greg Hunt, who's been resisting a push by coalition MPs to legalise nicotine vaping. And then um, editorial um, on Australia's being wise not to bow to the demands of lobby groups. Um, vaping causes serious medical issues and alarm bells are ringing. Um, now, just a reminder that in September, THC vaping and particularly THC products from illicit 
um, from illicit um, sources was already being, you know, quite um, strongly pointed to as as, the, as likely causes of um, of the lung injury. So um, there was very little mention of this in these reports. Um, the re this particular report also dismissed evidence of the effectiveness of e-cigarettes in helping people quit tobacco smoking as merely anecdotal, um, ignoring the, the randomised controlled trials that have um, been done showing that e-cigarettes e probably do help people quit smoking. Um, and as time has gone by, so as late as last month, November, and so we certainly knew more about um, and, um, the implication of vitamin E um, as, as being a, a very dangerous part of this equation. Um, Australian media was still presenting a, a very incomplete message, uh, painting a picture that nicotine vaping is possibly the main culprit. And this was a particularly alarming piece that I watched uh, on the 7.30 report on the ABC. Um, and it's available if you want to watch it online still. And it had a leading story, a personal story of a woman um, who quit smoking using vaping and she makes it quite clear that um, this was very important to her, that she was um, smoking a lot and other ways of quitting made no difference to her. And, um, and once she vaped, then you know, that, that was... That was it, that meant that she was able to quit tobacco smoking and um, and um, and has not looked back since. So a very strong frame in the study around the routine vaping. Then they had a science expert who said things like, what evidence is there for safety? There's no evidence. Someone who's driving has no idea what liquids. The, the journalists themselves said uh, vaping has been linked to at least 18 deaths and more than a thousand cases of lung disease. Uh, and the AMA vice president said that there's significant increases of vaping related illnesses, uh, ending up in intensive care, and there's deaths. But there was no mention of THC. This was all framed around the team vaping. Um, Billy, it's Louise. Oh. We've got about 10 minutes left. Okay, thanks. I've only got two slides. Yeah. Um, and this is important because the media is to um, abide by principles of accuracy, balance, clarity, and avoidance of harm. We know from people like Simon Chapman's work that the media can influence health behaviours. Um, and what could happen here is that the confusion could cause some people who, who vape nicotine to return to smoking. Um, it could cause vapor to use legal THC or CBD for medical reasons to give it up. It could cause people vaping THC products, purchase black market, to be unaware that they're actually using the high-risk item. So it's really important that we are um, that we are specific and accurate in the information we provide. So final slide. Um, these lung injury cases are still being investigated. Um, they're Identifying causes is a process of elimination, but it looks like nicotine is an unlikely cause. The likely causes seem to be THC oil vaping products with vitamin E acetate. People who don't smoke or vape anything should not be encouraged to take it up. And people who do smoke and vape should be provided with accurate and up-to-date information. Um, and that's available on the CDC and FDA websites. Broad sweeping statements like vaping causes serious lung injuries are unhelpful 
they are inaccurate and they could cause harm. It's important to be specific. Uh, lots of references and thank you. Great, thank you, Billy. Um, I just wanted, um, that was a really great presentation. I want to open up to questions. So if anybody um, has any questions, if you could just uh, type those in. So I know that you're wanting to ask a question. Can't see any questions um, coming through, um, but I have uh, a couple of questions, if that's okay. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, do we uh, have they, has the CDC um, indicated what I know they're investigating other substances? Have they given any idea about any other substances that might be linked? Uh, not, not that I've seen, Louise, no. I, I think what they're doing is they're, they're collecting samples and, and testing for whatever they can pick up in those samples at this stage. And they're just collecting as much data from the cases as they can as well. Okay. Um, uh, and the other uh, question that I had relates to... Um, I understand that it's from people purchasing through informal sources that seems to be the problem. But I'm assuming that if they're purchasing THC uh, vaping products from informal sources, they're also probably purchasing nicotine products from informal sources. Do we have, was there any data indicated whether, you know, um, there was any difference in the purchasing patterns of people around the different products? Uh, that's a really good question. So I've not, I've not seen anything. There, there might be some data about that. Um, I think because the THC um, vendors um, are obvious, because the THC oil um, is obviously implicated with these cases, um, the authorities are following lead. So it would be interesting, as you say, to know whether mm. vapors are also buying nicotine from those sorts of things. Yeah. Well, there was that one study that I showed, um, which if I can find the um, slide. Um, um, where they tested products um, and they only found the vitamin E acetate in the THC products, not in nicotine. I, I don't think that's actually used in nicotine products. Um, this, this study um, seems to suggest that um, the um, the only acetate is used to, to cut the THC oil, not nicotine. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, because I thought it was actually in both, um, but I might be, I thought there was some early study that indicated they found it in both, but I might be wrong with that. I'm just, I guess it's around, it seems to me the problem is purchasing these products on the black market is overall the problem. Um, so I think um, that's why good regulation is important. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, in terms of the advice that we give people, um, we should certainly be um, offering liquid nicotine that comes from good sources. Um, this is a really recent um, CDC study. Um, I don't think the vitamin E acetate is in nicotine products. Okay. Um, we do have a question from S. Mitchell. Um, uh, the question is, does Ivali show up on spirometry testing? Oh, I don't know. I've actually not seen um, spirometry testing in the US. I haven't. 
Um, so the scan used, um, yeah, that's a question as well. And I don't know whether there will be some respiratory physicians online who might know the answer to that one. Mm. And I have one more question. <laughs> um, has there been any data on the what the impact of this has been on, um, you know, people using these products? Was there any, has there been any, you know, has it caused a drop in use or? Yeah, so there's been some reports of um, some people who vape nicotine going back to tobacco smoking. Um, so that's, that's alarming to hear that. Um, and I think that that's, that's why for me it's important that we that we uh, communicate the right information to people. Uh -huh. um, I don't think there's any other questions. Uh, last chance, we've got three minutes. Um, does anyone else have any other questions for Billy? Okay. Okay, I think uh that's it um so i just want to say a very big thank you billy for uh doing that uh presentation it was really great to get a summary of all that information because there's been so much information coming through um and yeah if anyone has any other questions um you can always email um and billy had a email address on that slide uh, if you have any other questions after this presentation um uh, just send Billy an email, but otherwise, thank you very much. <laughs>